In this video we're going to take the Pyrus simulation and the house destruction that we've already made and we're going to look at rendering it in Mantra and we're going to look at some of the new Pyro shading tools for Houdini 18.5 and um, so yeah so before I do that I just want to play back the uh, cache of the uh, simulation that I let go with the sparse solver and uh, we see it going off here and uh, it seems it's reacting nicely with the house they all seem to tie together because we linked if you remember the pyro burst source with the uh, rigid body explosion and we can see some nice little things down here like the trails being dragged of the smoke by the debris coming through it that like these bricks are dragging these trails through um, but I'm not too keen on this sort of crunchiness towards the end here um, we can get finer grain control um, when we can actually go inside DOPS, which I will do in the uh, next video. We'll go in there and we'll look at more advanced ways of controlling this. But for now, a quick fix would be to actually, on the Pyrus Solver here, in the uh, Solving Shape tab, in the Disturbance field, is to adjust this speed so it kind of fades off over time. Or you could animate the Disturbance value down over time as well to not get that over, over crunchy look that we get here. Um, that looks a bit artifacty. We could also dissipate it a bit as well. So uh, I'll show you a few tricks in the next video how we can sort of improve the look of this. But at the moment, let's set this up for rendering so we can see it um, looking very, very nice, looking really nice. So um, there's a couple of things we need to do, first of all, in order to make our uh, volumes look better in the viewport. Let me stop templating the house for a moment. So what you really want to do, first off, is come to the display settings. So if you remember, that's this little eyeball icon down at the bottom of the toolbar or you can tap D with your cursor over the 3D view and um, we've got various settings here so what you want to do is go to the um, lights tab and uh, turn on first of all high quality lighting and shadows that just gives us a little bit better display of what's going on um, you can also go to volume quality and set that up to high and uh, but the one of the most important things is to go to this texture section here and turn off limit resolution this will stop your GPU limiting the resolution that you're trying to display of the uh, volume here and you will notice in a lot of cases you get a much better fidelity um, much better idea of what's going on here you will see a bit of a difference so um, yep those are the sort of major settings to kind of get this looking um, nice in the viewport although ideally you really want to render it properly to see it so the node I'm going to show you uh, now is um, if we hit tab we can go to the pyro new, uh, new pyro t uh, section here and we'll find it here it's the pyro bake volume so this kind of repla replaces the uh, pyro post process node and uh, this lets us fine tune the look and pull out a lot more detail here now you can actually tune the look of your simulation up here in the pyro node itself um, let me just demonstrate that quickly let's just uh, Put the resolution up to something high and let's go back to the uh, minimal open CL solve just for speed and um, let's just kick that in oh yeah if we've got um, it's loading in that collision source let's just disconnect that for a minute so uh, we're not loading in that that data just worried about the look for a moment so we'll let that just um, go for a second you'll notice there's a tab here called look and we can tune the look at this point and these are some of the basic tools just to give you an idea <coughs> of what's going on so we'll just stop it um, actually we'll, we'll let that go a little bit further and uh, we, we can see the smoke in there now the density of the smoke is quite high here up at 15 which is why we're getting that really dark look but as always we can tune that in the shader and get rid of the smoke if we don't want to if we don't want it etc so we can uh, do some quick stuff here we can obviously change the density you know get rid of the smoke entirely if you want but it's the smoke um, that's hiding the flames that makes it look interesting we'll come back to that principle in a moment the density sitting over the flames there to sort of give more detail Ooh, didn't mean to go inside that there we go obviously you can change the color of the smoke and then we've got this fire so the fire is what's making it uh, glow inside the fire field and then uh, this is the range of the flames remember we measured that with our uh, display and it's just over one was the maximum uh, heat of the flame and you can sort of control that so here it's um, only the brightest parts of the flame are hot and the, the uh, coolest parts or rather down to point 0.2 and the flame range here is at zero so this is the bottom of the, ra the ramp this is the top of the ramp so the values of one in flame are up here and the values of point 0.2 
uh, down this part of the ramp and anything below point 0.2 will be clipped at zero for you. So you can control a bit more precisely how the flame goes through there. And then we're colouring it here with a, a, a ramp and we've got these other methods which I'll talk about actually in a moment and these other settings. So you can kind of tune a look here but um, what we tend to use is the pyro bake volume and you can plug this directly into your sim and see it updating as you go but um, it does slow it down a bit especially on the GPU because this is not GPU accelerated and takes time to uh, process properly and it's a very very good indication these days of what you're actually going to render so very close to what you see in the viewport is what you'll actually render so um, let's just talk about this uh, a little bit uh, in detail first and there's still something else that we need to set up but let's set this shader up first so first of all at the top here uh, you'll see it's linked to a shader this is internal if you go inside you'll see the shader here so this is why it is pretty much what you see is what you get when you render because this shader you'll see is actually linked to the settings above there's a few extra controls here for example like you can change the absorption and shadow color get some really lovely shading on your smoke and you can change the scattering phase but pretty much everything else is the same is connected from above you can actually make an instance of that if you want but um, it's best not to so it's linked to that shader here um, if you turn on max viz resolution then you can clip again the resolution that this node processes because it can get really slow on high res stuff so if we bring that down to 64 um, that should limit my voxel display there let me just go into another viewport just see if that works so let me just um, pop there into another view another scene view see if we can get it to work here So, oh yeah, that's because this is a very low res simulation to begin with, that's why. Let me plug it into this, the uh, cached version, because this cached version is a lot higher. There we go. So um, displaying it, <laughs> there you go, as 8 voxels, or a 16, or 256 resolution, or 512, up like that. So you'll see with the 256, we're not really clipping it, that's why the visualizer probably wasn't showing us much of a change there. So let me go down to 16. So we can... Um, limit the resolution here. I'm going to turn that off so we see the full glory of the simulation. And uh, here's the density scale. 15 is what we saw in the shader so that we get that really dense look if we want. And we can change the uh, shadow color to make it seem even more dense if you like. The smoke and obviously you can change the color of the smoke there to whatever you want. Um, and you could use a ramp for the smoke color so where it's zero density here or one density you can change the, the uh, perceived shading on it there. Let's just um, set that back to constant or you can just turn the smoke off entirely which is how you can totally tune your look so um, there are some quick setups here by the way um, here this will create extra nodes this will create uh, an instance of the no the uh, material that's inside so you can have it outside if you want uh, this will break the references to it so you can customize other stuff uh, you can create a node to sharpen the volumes if you want and it will create an entire light and camera setup for you if you want as well um, or in this tab we can initialize it so this will set it up for edge scattering or for black body flame so basically it'll either set up this tab or this tab but I tend to use both so we'll set these up manually so um, let's first of all talk about um, the uh, the uh, fire so the fire is using the flame field if we turn that on You'll see it's um, our flame is um, our flame field is in there. Now that's looking a bit blocky. Let's go back to the other scene view. See if that looks better. There we go. Sometimes it doesn't update. So there you go. Now we're seeing the the nice detail in there. So if uh, if I click on the uh, beforehand, that's what we were getting out of the simulation based on the look, the visualizer. Um, yeah, let's just turn off the. Uh, wireframe on shaded there and uh, if I look through the pyro bake volume see it all lights up because we've uh, we're lighting up that uh, the uh, flame field using the flame field to illuminate this and again between 0 and 1 of the flame field that's our source range uh, so zero is down at this part of the ramp so where it's cool we're getting black and where it's hot we're getting this sort of color and it's peeking out as you can see now this is connected um, actually in the bindings so you'll see here for the fire that we've turned on we're using the temperature field for both the intensity and the color so the temperature is driving this and it's driving the ramp as well but you can change that field you could drive this through another field if you wanted to like density or whatever so again we can adjust the scale we can brighten that up or um, leave it low if we want 
to kind of get that. Or we can play with the range here. So if we clip that, bring that down, we're clipping it because we're sort of putting the whole range here only between 0 and 0 0.2. But we know our smoke goes just over 1. So if I put this to 2, then we're never going to sort of reach those high peak values if we go higher. Now, there's a slight... Um, Maybe an issue, maybe not. Um, but when we're looking at these colors, these um, are actually calculated in the ACES color space. And uh, we should really be working in the right color space to see the correct intensities and stuff. You can work like this and without it, but it's best not to. So what I will do, actually, is just save this scene. And I'm going to show you how we can set up ACES in Houdini so that we can uh, look at this in the right color space. So the first thing we need to do is uh, go to this website. Uh, this is the opencolorio.org, OCIO.org, and here is where you can download um, all the data that you'll need to set up um, ACES. And uh, it'll explain to you um, all about what um, everything that ACES is about. So um, just to cut the long story short, really, um, lots of uh, a, a color space is how we represent colors on different monitors. You know, different monitors, different displays, different cameras all represent color in different ways. This uh, ACES is a way to try and standardize that. So we can uh, color profile all those different inputs, put them into a standard format for color, work in that standard format, and then we can output to a bunch of agreed profiles for the different mediums because again TV shows different colors to your phone and it's the idea is to standardize color throughout the industry so that's the idea of this so we need to basically create um, a viewer so we can see that stand that Houdini looking correct in the colors that when you take it to your comp program it will look exactly the same so you need to download this and I'll show you how to set it up. If you want to read more information, you should go and read the documentation and stuff because it's a far bigger scope than we have time for today. So um, you want to go to the download section here and just basically download these sample configurations. This will give you everything you absolutely need. And uh, when you download it, uh, un uh, unzip it and then open it up to a, a, a directory that you know where it is. And uh, you're interested in this file here, this config dot OCIO. This is going to tell Houdini uh, which profiles are here and how to use them. So we need to tell Houdini where this particular file is. So what you want to do is copy the path and also the name of this file. And then where you want to um, put that is here where you've installed Houdini in your home account. You'll notice your Houdini 18.5 folder. And this is where you've got all your preferences and your digital assets, all of that business. And you'll notice your Houdini environment file here, the Houdini.env file. So what you need to do is open that up and you need to edit it. And the, you need to come down and put in OCIO and then equals and then in, uh, in inverted commas you need to put the path to that config file, the config.ocio. That way Houdini when you open it will be able to find that file and use it within the software. So make sure um, you put that path in there. So install it wherever you want, doesn't really matter, put it somewhere sensible obviously, then copy your path. Um, and then fill that out in the Houdini environment file which can be found in your home account in the Houdini 18.5 folder. So don't forget to save that. Let me save that. Now um, if we go back to um, <coughs> go back to Houdini here you'll need to uh, basically go to edit color settings. Now if you go to color settings here you'll see it says OCIO config. Now you could use a browser um, and if you connect it, it doesn't seem to work for me. It's when you do the path. So don't worry about that. What you want to do actually is just quit Houdini. And when you reopen it again, because that path was filled out, it should load ACES for you. So I'm going to pause the video while I save and quit Houdini. And I'm going to reopen it again. There we go. I've reopened Houdini. And uh, the first thing you'll notice is the colors obviously look different. We've got a much richer um, display of the colors here in our simulation we can see a bit more detail and uh, also you'll notice the uh, backgrounds also got a, gone a different color um, because we're now viewing this in the ACES sRGB color space and this is the color space um, these shaders were designed in so um, they should look a little bit uh, better for you so when you render these images out now if you render them as EXR when you bring them in your compositing program running also ACES, you want to be choosing the linear um, ACES CG profile because we'll be writing out linear files, but we're working the ACES CG 
um, color space. And if you bring that in in, say, Nuke or some other compositing program that supports ACES, like DaVinci Resolve, and you choose the linear ACES um, profile when you load these EXRs in, they'll look exactly the same as they do in the viewport here and also in um, Houdini's renderer. So we can actually, in the viewport here, we can actually bring up some color controls. If you click on Perspective here, you can come down to the uh, Correction Toolbar. And this brings up the uh, color correction toolbar at the bottom here, just like you see in um, mPlay. And uh, look, there we see we've got ACES turned on here. So you can disable ACES or enable it again. And then you can choose um, your particular color profiles here. So at the moment with sRGB, because I'm on sRGB monitor, but we could preview it for um, Rec 709, which will look slightly brighter. So if you're outputting for TV, or you can see the raw file without any color encoding on it whatsoever, the raw linear file. We could see it under login coding if you want, um, but none of those are going to look right really. sRGB is the kind of one we want to ideally be working in maybe uh, most of the time. If you do bring in 8-bit textures or other textures, again you need to convert them into the ACES color space using the conversion nodes in um, in your VOPs, in, in your shading networks and Houdini. But we won't worry about that for now, that's for another lesson, but these colors are already in the correct color space for us which is uh, really nice. Actually, if you go to the um, color settings menu again now and go to color settings, you'll see the path that you typed in is filled out for you. And uh, you do want to turn on color picker and swatches as well so that these also obey the color rules that you see. That way, when you pick a color, it's going to look the same over here. Otherwise, they'll be in a different color space. So you should turn that on as well, I believe, if you're using um, this color correction. So if you can see the path and it all looks funky, it's all working. If not, uh, check your Houdini environment file and uh, restart again. But look, that's looking much, much better. So again, if I compare it before the pyro bake and I compare it after, it looks much better. So um, as we saw, we could turn on the fire here and now we've got it in the ACES color space. It's looking a lot better. And like I said, this is going to be quite close to how we are actually going to render it. So um, we'll talk about rendering in a moment. Let's uh, tune a bit of a look in first. So the secret to making this look good is to putting um, the density field back over the top to add more detail in there. And uh, we can actually use the density field as a mask. So we can turn on enable masking down here and uh, that'll allow, like I say, the density field to come back over the flames there. And we'll see a lot more of that lovely detail that we've um, got in our sim. There we go, we've got quite a lot of smoke coming in there. Let me bring the density back down to one. So we can see some of the flames coming through. But obviously, you know, you sculpt the look to how you want it. So look, you can see the flames inside there coming back through the density. So maybe it looked better if we had more density in there. But again, if you've got a reference, obviously, you would match that as best, best that you can. So that's looking kind of interesting at that stage. Um, now, you've got some control over that mask. So um, first of all, let me just turn the... Uh, smoke off. Let's just talk about the colors quickly. So the color ramp here, um, just like the other one before, is we can adjust the flame range here. So as you saw, if I bring a, a lower number down, I'm going to clip more of those values and it's going to get a br lot brighter. Let's give it a second to kick in, see it gets uh, a brighter again. If I drop that down further, it'll get even brighter again because uh, the zero temperature is getting the dark colors and the this end of the uh, point 0.1 in my flame field is going to get the bright colors, which is pretty much everything there. So we knew our flame range was roughly about 1.1 when we used our visualizer before, something like that. But um, one's probably good enough. Um, and you can obviously put your own custom colors in there if you want to. Um, so yeah, let's put the uh, smoke back on. So... Um, there are other methods here. I'll talk about those in a moment. So we can also add scatter. So what the scatter is, it's trying to simulate the uh, light scattering around in the density from our flame field here. So it's going to do similar to the fire here. So let's just turn that on for a second. And uh, you'll see it makes all the uh, density glow. There we go. And again, it's using a density mask down the bottom here to see stuff through there. So it looks like the fire's illuminated from, from inside. And it saves you all the uh, having to actually uh, calculate all that at render time. So uh, I'm just going to turn that off for a minute and just talk about the masks using the fire. 
I like to tune the fire in first myself and then look at the scattering afterwards. So on the mask here really, um, we're kind of, as I say, mapping the density value. So you can play with that a bit. So for example, if you increase the uh, mask center, what you'll see is uh, you're moving the midpoint of where the density is and uh, essentially you're seeing more through the masks. So if you put the number up higher, you're gonna see more of that brightness of the flame coming through the mask as before, so you're kind of fading the effect off. So let me bring that back down to um, a nice happy value. So if you want to see some more flame in there, basically you can bring the mask down. And uh, the mask width, again, sort of, um, let's have a look at that for a sec, just kind of expands the uh, range of that. So basically they're used in conjunction with each other to um, make your brightnesses and stuff. So um, with the uh, mask center, um, higher values uh, will get the volume to be appear internally as you saw, we glow internally as we saw, it makes it much brighter, the masking effect less, and lower numbers makes it more dense. And uh, the mask width um, can help sort of the brighter values stand out more if you put higher values in. So if we just put up the uh, mask width there, just give that a second, you'll see we get a much brighter, uh, sharper details. And you can control the contrast um, between the two. And you can take that further by actually using a ramp. So again, um, this is where the masking's happening, so sort of between the bright and dark areas. So if you bring up the uh, dark areas, you'll see you won't get so much masking, you're allowing the light to come through. Just like you would with a, an alpha mask, you know, the black's multiplying it off there. And again, you can change that through the range of your temperature um, based on the ramp there. So if you you can really control how much of the scatter or the fire that um, can come up or put, you know through the smoke and be around that. So we don't really want the flame to do that kind of glowiness. That's what the uh, scatter is going to do. So you've got a lot of control here. Uh, this is the main mode, the color ramp, where you've got a quite a lot of control to really tune the look. But you've got to obviously match your reference quite accurately. And uh, if you notice, it's the same in the scatter. So again, um, we've got the color ramp, we've got our masking. So let's let that pop in. So again, um, lower values will make that stronger. So we'll see less of a glow. So if I just bring that down a bit. And uh, increasing the, mark, the width, the mask width will allow it to be um, brighter in those bright areas. So pr improving the contrast, depending on the kind of look and the detail that you want to go for. So that looks kind of really interesting and funky. And then we can kind of uh, use that blurring effect. If I bring that down, then we won't see the field blurred so much throughout the volume. There we go. And um, obviously you can bring that up a little bit. So if it is quite dense, you're going to see less blur to suggest that denseness. And you'll see we're seeing through all that lovely detail to the glowing core there. And it looks really, really sort of nice and impressive. Excellent, and it does uh, quite render like that. Let's um, talk about the other colors and then we'll um, have a look at the uh, rendering. So let's um, talk about the uh, other color methods. So the color ramp's completely customizable. As you saw, you can really get the look that you want. But um, as I mentioned, there's other methods. So these other two methods are sort of physical methods. They're not going to give you control over the colors, but they're going to be physically accurate based on the temperature change that you're going to get in the field. Um, and there's sort of two models for cho choosing that, the Planck model or the physical black body model. So uh, let's have a look at the physical black body model. So ideally, if you're going to do one for the fire, you should do the same for the scatter. So let me pop over to the scatter and choose a physical black body because there's more scatter going on here. And you'll see if that updates, um, it looks similar-ish, but a little bit more ready in the tone there because of the nature of the uh, scale of the black body. Again, it's going from sort of reds down, uh, yellow, whites down to yellows, down to reds, down to blacks, that kind of thing. So the first thing you'll notice is some of the controls have changed. Um, let me just come back a few frames so we can see less of the density there, more of the sort of flame and scatter. In fact, let me turn the scatter off so we can talk about it with just the flame. We'll see what's really going on here. So um, they're pretty much the same for both. So the first thing we can do is just uh, scale it all up or scale it all down globally. 
so you can make it brighter and darker so think of it as that color ramp and then um, we've got sort of the ambient temperature and this uh, temperature that the uh, overall flame was at and remember we saw this when we uh, in the simulation tab on our solver so this should really be set to the same so we've got the same kind of ranges going in there but you could actually cool it down here as well so saying that the peak was only a thousand or the peak was at uh, 10,000 you know you can heat it up but in our sim it was uh, 3,000 generally I, I like to keep those the same uh, and if I do want to ad uh, adjust it I might just you know s just slightly scale up everything just give it a brightness now you can uh, enable tone mapping here. Uh, this kind of takes it out of the realm of physical accuracy. Ideally you want to leave this to one and leave all these numbers and control the colors from your simulation, make it cooler and hotter. But that can often be hard to manage because obviously if you change the temperature it's going to move differently. So it's probably better just to let it move and use the color ramp to color it. But we do have some control over this if you want to use these methods for the color ramps. So if you turn on enable tone mapping um, this will allow us to adjust sort of the bright ends and the dark ends of the ramp. You'll we suddenly see a bit more of this readiness at the lower end and the, a bit more of the brightness at the top end. So we can control that. The adaption is uh, basically the low end. So if I bring this number down, we'll clip off some of those reds. Actually, we don't want zero. That will get rid of it <laughs> all entirely. So let's have a small number. And uh, you'll see those reds in the flame have gone down. And as I bring this down... Um, I'll slowly eat into that ramp up to the brighter levels so I can kind of clip off um, all the lower levels of the ramp sort of the reds and the blacks as I bring that number down towards zero there so we can really sort of fade off or if you want to see a bit more of the red in the f in the smoke there you can bring that up a bit so maybe something like 0.06 something like this and then with the burn, um, that's the other end. Again, that's the bright end. So as we put higher numbers in, we'll start clipping out and brightening up the top end. You'll see it makes it hotter and hotter in that end. And you can use that in conjunction with the scale. If you go too crazy, you get um, obviously a bit wacky colours because it's starting to go out of the realms of um, physical reality there. But you can uh, mess around with this and sort of get a nice control over what's going on there. So the uh, next shading model I want to show you is the uh, plank, bottle, plank back black body shader. So if I switch to that one, that's a little slower than the others. And uh, you'll see it peaks out quite bright. And that's fine. We can just bring the scale back down. So this one you just want to scale down to, a, let's say, a value of 1. And there we go. And that sort of brings it back into the realms of the color um, that we want. And again, uh, let me just set this back to 1. <coughs> Just so we're not over bright, brightening it, over brightening it. So again, you can up the scale here, and you can play with the uh, overall temperature of it. So if you want it to be hotter, you could put a uh, 3500 in here. And again, you're just stretching the range from what it actually was. But this one has the least sort of control. And um, you know, if you've got the simulation physically correct, then this should be more accurate to the colours that you'll get. So again, if I just enable scattering on this one here, and uh, let me set this to the same mode, plank black body, just make sure that they're on the same settings. There we go, so you get a, quite a um, different look to what we're getting. Let me go to frame 24. So when you come to um, render this, that should look quite nice. So we'll set up the um, lights and stuff in a minute and then tweak the shader. So um, let me just see, it takes a while to go through. So there you go, that's the kind of look you're getting on the pyro there. So if we switch them back to, um, oh, didn't want to do that. <laughs> so let's um, just undo that quickly. So on the uh, pyro bake volume here, let's on the scatter switch this back to uh, physical black body. And uh, I'll do the same for the fire. So it takes, as you see, it's quite slow to process, especially on a lot of voxels here, and uh, depending on your machine. So this is why you have the uh, maximum resolution there as well. So let's do the physical black body. And um, so if we, what do we do? We put a thing there. So there, there you go. That gives a different sort of look in itself. Uh, oh, actually, we need to put the scale back up, don't we? We need 250 here. 
and um, we'll need to also we have got the scatter up at 250 as well there we go let's put the glow back in so it's really up to you which method you choose um, I can actually show you that I've done a little render test of the three different models on the same sort of simulation here let me just make that a little bigger and you can see kind of how the difference in the glows and the colors change obviously the ramps you can completely customize how you want um, and then the other two depending on sort of the ranges that you want to put in there you can get the um, control over the looks so there's a lot of um, options there to, to match a reference or be as creative as you want but the real secret to this really is the masking is allowing that density fill to come back in and allowing you to pull out that real detail that hopefully you've pulled out with your um, disturbance and your um, other fields that you've been using in your shaping section in the pyro solver here. So um, what I'm going to do now is um, pause the video and um, for the next chapter we're going to uh, look at setting up the uh, lights in the camera and we'll talk about um, rendering the house in a more efficient way and there's a couple of little tricks and a new couple of um, tools that we can use to um, help us render the house quite nicely so that once the smoke comes in that's looking quite interesting so um, let's set up the lighting what, I'm, what I am going to do actually um, before I go anywhere is uh, split up this geometry you'll notice I've got my nice geometry here from the cache and I've got my pyro bake but they're all in the same uh, node here so what I want to do is kind of um, split these these guys up into um, other networks it'll just make managing the scene a little easier so I'm going to hide this house model node and uh, actually when we're inside here after this RBDIO I'm going to um, rename the nulls here let me go back to frame one so we're not having to um, try and display this heavy cache there we go let me just jump back to frame one so I'm going to call this um, house out and um, let's just color that red you can tap C for the color palette or click up here on the color palette if you want. Let me tap P to get rid of that for the moment. And um, what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to shade it. I'll use the Pyro Bake in the other network actually. So we'll call this um, Pyro Out as well. So we have two nulls that we can easily find later. We use uppercase letters basically because they appear at the top of the tree view and they're easier to find. And uh, what I'm going to do is just control C on the pyro bake volume here because um, I'm going to use that in a, at a different node. So we're going to turn that off so we're not going to see it in the display. But I'm going to make a, a geometry node and I'm going to call this uh, pyro. And inside here I'm going to create a, an object merge node. And this will allow me to import the um, whatever I want from another network. So let's click on the uh, browser here. We can see our house model and this is the tree view and you'll notice um, all the uppercase appears at the top here and there's our house out. Uh, we wanted pyro didn't we? There's our pyro out. So I'm going to hit accept and uh, that'll bring in the uh, pyro. We haven't got any frames in there. Let's go to maybe frame 8 so we can load a little bit in. There we go. We can see it come in. Now we really want to just put into this object on. This will just make sure that we're baking down any transforms and making sure that um, any offsets you might have put up here uh, are considered so it comes into the right place. So there we go, we have a pyro object that's going to render for us, it's going to bring all the stuff through and in here actually I'm going to control V, I'm going to paste in that pyro bake volume so uh, we can process that instead and there we go so we can see the difference between the two shading models we've got that on physical black body at the minute so yeah, we can uh, once we get the render going, we can fine tune, decide which model to choose later on there. So um, we've got a bit of a warning. That's fine. Oh yeah, it's because of the uh, bacon there. So um, I'm going to also repeat that. Let's make a, another geometry node here, and let's call this house. And then inside here again, we'll bring in our object merge node. Let me open up the browser, and we'll find our house out null. And then we'll say into this object and you'll see it's bringing in the simulation there so uh, yep we could uh, do all that leave it like that that's good for the moment let's go back to frame one so that's good we have these two objects that we're going to render and we have this as kind of a reference and this spotlight as well um, that's more like a reference light as well for that was when we were playing with the shading so let's just call that a ref and I'm going to turn off enable so we don't have 
that working in the scene at the minute. So um, I'm just going to create a plane, a, a grid object, and we'll call this a uh, ground. And uh, at this level, I'm just going to scale it up, maybe to 100, just to give us some kind of perspective there. And let's pop a camera in. So um, I'm going to pick up a nice view, maybe this angle. So I'm going to imagine I've got my cameraman, he's standing on the ground here. So let's control click on camera, which drops it in this view. And um, I want to consider the focal length, like all good cameramen do. So here's the focal length. Now this is weird, because I control clicked, it's kind of picked up the settings from the perspective view, which is not a realistic at all here. So I just want to right click and revert to defaults the aperture. So it's more like a, a real world aperture. And then we can use sort of more sensible real world numbers for the focal length here. So cameras go tend to go between sort of very wide lenses at 8 up to sort of 300 mil. But if I was a, a cameraman filming something blowing up, I'd want to stand uh, quite a way away, a safe distance. I'd probably use something like 150 mil lens um, so I can zoom in. And uh, it's called a zoom lens, which flattens the perspective. It gives it quite an interesting perspective look, but also means we're quite a far distance away, even though we look like we're quite close to it, which means we'll see all that lovely debris come and fly at the camera. So, um, and it's the kind of lens that um, someone would use. So let's come down to the ground. He's just standing there with his camera, filming this thing, and it just goes bang. So we'll frame it center-ish. And if I just jump forwards a few frames, um, both our geometries will pop into their respective nodes, and we'll see them their displays there. There we go. So that's with the black body shader there for the minute. We'll, we can change that later on. So that's it, how it's going to look, hopefully quite dramatic. So um, you should always consider your focal length and try and think like a, a real cameraman, you know, what choices would they make and why, because uh, make your stuff look realistic very easily. Cool, I'm just going to turn off the pyro for a minute. We'll just worry about the house. We'll get that going. So um, the, for the light in the scene, um, I'm just going to actually um, control click here on environment light. So this will create uh, an environment light, basically, um, which is an environment. So for that, you want to load a high dynamic range or an HDR image in. Um, so that there's some that come installed with Houdini. If you click on the little browser, you can actually click on here, Houdini pick HDR, HDRI, and you'll see um, a few come with it. I'm going to pick this top one, noon. So we've got a, a nice bright sort of noon day. Um, So you'll notice when we load that in, let me just unlock the camera for a sec. Oh, let's have a look. It's quite dark. It's quite dark because of um, it's not in the right color space. As I mentioned, we're working in ACES CG. Um, can I zoom out a bit more? There, there we go. We get a better idea of what's going on. So we're working in ACES CG, so it should look um, better than that in the viewport. So we need to convert it to the right color space. Um, we can increase some brightness here, but you'll see it's a little bit... Um, looks a bit funky. So to do that, um, we're going to make a COP network. So let's um, create a COP network. Let's dive inside. So uh, first of all, I want the path actually of that file. So here, let's just control C where that file is. And uh, we'll bring a file node in, in our COP net. And we'll just paste in that image. Now we can preview this by clicking on the composite view here. And then we'll see our image in there. So it's not quite in the uh, right color space yet. Um, yep, does it detect it here? No, it doesn't. So auto detect from file. So yeah, it's a linear color space, um, but it's not in ACES yet. So we need to do the conversion. Now to do that, we need to make a VOP filter. So let's pop a VOP filter in and dive inside. And here we can uh, manipulate sort of the image data. Now uh, you'll notice we've got our red, green, and blue channels here. Um, you don't really want to, you don't need to do this for the alpha because of the black and white information. But um, what I really want to do is if you start to type OCIO, you'll see we've got an OCIO transform. So this will convert the colors for us. And if you look, we actually go from a space to a space. But you'll notice it wants a, a vector in, and we've only got our floats of each color here. So we need a, a vector to float. So I can, uh, and, oh, that's for the other side. And we need a float to vector. That's what we need first. So a float to vector means we can plug in our red and our green and our blue and we can create our RGB here and that's what we plug into the transform. 
and then we'll plug the output of the transform back into this vector to float and then we're going to plug in our new red and our new green and our new blue to see the result here. Now to see the result we need to turn on the output flag, this brown one and uh, oh, the display flag there. So if I switch between the two Oh, hang on, we haven't changed the profile yet. <laughs> That's a good point. So yeah, on the transform here, we haven't done anything. So um, it's not really uh, in a linear space. What it really was, actually, if we come down here, <coughs> right to the bottom, we want to choose Utility Linear sRGB because it was in a linear space, but it was also an sRGB encoding in the linear space. So um, we should choose that. And then um, to linear, we're using ACES CG. So if you pop that in, You'll see it just gets a little bit more unsaturated. And it should look um, a bit more realistic to the colours that um, it was shot with. So if I just switch between the uh, two displays, you can see the the difference there. So we want to write this out. So I'm going to create a uh, a ROP file output here. We just want a single frame, and uh, I'm going to call this um, let's call it converted HDR. So or we'll converted um, env map environment map. There we go. So we'll just uh, render that out. And uh, what I'm going to do is right click and copy parameter here. And then on my um, let's go back to the scene view here. So on my environment light, I'm just going to paste the uh, relative reference. And uh, you'll see it's loaded in our slightly better color map. Cool. So yeah, you must uh, do the correct tran uh, transforms for your particular um, images that you bring in, especially if you're using ACES. So um, we've got our environment light in there um, now with the correct colors. What I'm going to do is just uh, rotate it around in the transform here. I can see which direction the sun's coming in. Actually, if we've got the high quality lighting on, we do. Do we need anti alias shadows? Not really, I suppose. But um, yep, I can't really see uh, where the sun is. There's a couple of tricks we can do with that. Uh, one of them is to render it, obviously. The other is to um, put a shiny sphere in there. We won't, won't do that for a minute. We'll set up a render and then we'll um, fine tune it. So, um, yeah, one little trick. Yeah, actually, we'll show you that trick quickly. So let's drop a sphere in there. I'm just going to make that large. So I'm going to apply a, a, a shiny shader to this sphere so I can see a specular highlight on it and then I can tell which direction the sun's coming in by looking through the camera here. So I'm just going to pop in a principled shader. Um, let me just make that a bit smaller so I can see the options here. And uh, what we'll do is we'll bring the roughness down but it's very shiny there. Let's just drag that on. So I'm just dragging and dropping it on. So if we go to the um, object mode here and let me select the environment light. Now if I um, rotate it you can see that highlight on the front of the ball there moving around. So I can see if I move it over here it's oh, there we go it's directly in front of us but um, up there it's kind of three quarter angle on that side of the roof. So we'll try something like that. So I'm going to call this a uh, reflector but I'm going to hide that. It was just there for a guy just to help me set up the lighting in a quick visual way. So um, we want to do a test render to check this works and then we'll apply um, a material to um, the house there. So I'm just going to go to the render tab here and I'm going to create a render node and we'll use Mantra PBR, so the physically based rendering engine. Let's just get rid of the IPR node there. So we'll use this for our uh, render tests. So um, the first thing I'm going to do actually is go to the render tab. Now I'm generally going to be rendering the volume with um, the shader here and actually if I um, turn off the ray variance anti-aliasing uh, the, the volume will render a lot quicker so when I what, generally you would render these in passes you'd render the volume in one pass the pyro you'd render this in another pass and then you could change sort of your anti-aliasing method to um, get an optimum optimal render for both passes but since I'm going to be rendering both together I like to use um, turn off the ray trace variance anti-aliasing because uh, I find it quicker particularly to render the volume as I mentioned. So we're going to keep that down for now. I'm going to go to limits and actually bring down the uh, ray limits here. We only need a few to get through the glass and not too many reflections in there. So again, just want to speed up the render a little bit. 
and um, in the shading tab um, we're not going to do sort of any interesting glass if we're going to do sort of color attenuation in the glass you'd want to turn this on but we're not going to do any effects like that so I can leave that off for a minute so these are kind of the base settings I'm going to use for, for the moment oh and I'm going to turn on override camera resolution just for speed so if I pop over to the render view here we can open up the bars here and again look we can see we're working in the ACES sRGB color space um, so let's hit render and um, see how quick that takes so it'll convert the scene for us and um, hopefully it'll just render the little house there so now that I've opened up those menus I can click on this home icon and just make sure I'm seeing the pixels one to one here first thing you'll notice it doesn't render the uh, back plate there by default and uh, it's very bright actually um, let me go to the environment light here that's right let me set the exposure to zero and then hopefully we'll see the um, update for us and it's also quite bright because we haven't really got any decent materials on there at the moment so maybe I'll just bring this down to um, 0.5 for the moment just to make that a bit more dull and we can see um, the light direction where that's coming from so it's a bit uh, shadowy on the front there let me uh, bring that back around maybe 100 oh there you go that's illuminated right from the front there so 100 is kind of good got nice um, front lighting there and again I'll leave that for the moment before I play with the intensities because once I put some materials on there it'll look a bit more interesting so um, let me just tap P and uh, bring this pane back down I clicked on the little triangle here with the uh, arrow coming down to flatten that back down again so um, let's create some materials first of all, I'm going to go to the material palette here and drag the principal shader over and let's call this uh, um, the floor or the ground the ground material we call it ground didn't we so let's call that ground and uh, I'm going to go to this surface here and let's just give it a sort of uh, a brownish color I'm not going to be applying texture maps or UVs and stuff to this we're just gonna sort of keep it kind of simple with the materials so simple brownish color um, I don't want any reflectivity in there because I'll just slow things down and um, I'm just going to literally drag it and drop it onto the ground there because it's just one object so if we just hit render there we go we see our ground has uh, popped in there let's maybe desaturate the color a bit more lighten it up actually keep it darker but desaturate it something like that might be interesting excellent so that's kind of the easiest way oop, to add a shader so what I'm going to do now is um, make some materials for the house here so again let's drag over another principled shader and um, this time I might use one of the presets let's choose uh, concrete um, the reason I'm doing that is uh, I don't want, I'm going to turn off the displacement I don't want to see the displacement on the concrete I'm going to use this for the bricks themselves but um, in the textures here again I don't really want the uh, base color we'll just put a block color in but I'll leave the roughness in there just to create some variation um, in the shininess of it and uh, let's make it that sort of a, a, a darkish color a dark sort of gray maybe with a slight hint of warmth to it but something like that we'll start with a bit of gray for the minute and again I'm going to bring the reflectivity right down so we're not getting too many samples necessary on there because the roughness is quite high we want to sample quite a lot so um, let's call this um, concrete so how do we um, start applying this so um, let me go to the object level when I dragged and dropped if we go to the ground node here when I dragged and dropped the shader into the viewport here it actually applied it at this level at the object level as you can see we've got a path here but I can't do that for this house because it's made of lots of objects if I applied the shader now it would apply to everything so we need to override it now fortunately when we built our system we made lots and lots of groups so we're going to use the groups to help us with this so if I dive inside um, remember we can middle click and we see we have um, our groups here so I'm going to create a material node and here we can use the groups to assign um, our materials so first of all on this first tab I'm just going to link into my um, concrete material there we go we can find it there and we'll see that should um, make everything go grey so we should see that get a little darker so yeah it applied it to everything so um, what I want to do is um, 
come up here and we can choose uh, bricks and then hopefully it should just apply to the bricks not sure why the uh, ground has lost its material there so um, let me just stop the render and restart it again interesting the ground lost its color shouldn't do that because um, we have got nothing applied to it so um, let's wait for that to start again there we go and um, hopefully the ground's gone brown again there we go fair enough it just lost it for a moment so we can uh, make the other materials here so let me uh, come over here and uh, I'm going to make a material for the uh, tiles so um, actually let's do the wood so uh, again let's just make that a darkish browny colour maybe a bit more uh, darker and a bit more desaturated maybe more ashy ashy oh, we said it was going to be oak didn't we we gave it the uh, physical properties of oak and again I'm going to bring the reflectivity down and uh, maybe the roughness up again I don't want too many samples on there I might turn that off actually for speed if it's looking no uh, noisy too noisy so uh, we'll rename this to uh, wood and then actually I'm just going to copy the concrete here let's right click and um, go to actions and choose um, copy where is it we haven't got that maybe just control C and control V now there is a duplicate oh it is at the bottom there duplicate there we go so we'll duplicate the concrete here and we'll call these uh, tiles I'll assign these all in a moment so the tiles will give sort of um, a bit more of a ready terracotta colour let's just desaturate make that a bit darker again maybe a bit more red looking quite woody there it's a bit more ready so kind of a terracotta maybe a bit more red in that color hopefully a bit more different to the woods brown yeah quite different to the woods brown and again um, we've got the same roughness and shininess there so we've got that as the, we'll apply that to all the tiles oh and the most important one glass so let's pop in our principal shader here and uh, I'm going to use a preset this time so if we pop down here we can choose glass as our preset and we'll just leave that as it is and uh, again we'll call this glass so we know what materials are which so if I go back to the um, house here we can make our tabs for those other objects so let's click another plus and uh, here we'll add the uh, door and the uh, door frame and the window frame so there's door, door frame and uh, window frame all those groups and here we can simply choose our wood there we go and we'll see all our woods hopefully go dark now we can actually use a render region here to speed things up a little bit if you hold down shift and left click and drag you'll see it um, pops in there again not sure if that's updating correctly let me just hit render because we seem to be missing our window frames So um, we'll just wait for that render to kick off. And uh, yeah, we are missing the frames. Um, oh, the render stopped there. So that's not going to be a problem um, that we're missing the window frames. We can fix that quite easily. It seems like some of the groups going through the pipeline, let me stop the render there, um, haven't come through so um, we'll fix that in a moment so let me start the uh, kick the render off again so I'm just going to assign the other materials and then we'll fix that uh, window frame issue so I'm going to click plus again and um, we've done the window frames let's do our uh, roof tiles so let's click tiles here and then uh, if I click on the side here we can see um, we've got the word tile in all the tiles so I can use wild cards here I could start type star tiles star so anything with the word tiles will get this uh, material applied um, that should work with wild cards it's not okay fair enough then <laughs> so we'll just specify them roof tiles and uh, ridge tiles there we go so they uh, kick in there 
and then we'll click a, another plus tab here and on the group we'll choose our glass our window glass and then we'll choose our glass material so um, as we can see there's a, a couple of issues here uh, the first issue being that um, our frames aren't being picked up with the group or our wooden door there. Did we put the door in the wooden group? Door door frame, yeah, the door's there as well. So yeah, all well, our woods and our glass is looking a bit odd. So uh, we're going to fix, let me stop that rendering for a sec. We're going to fix the, um, both those issues um, right now. So to do that, I'm going to go back into the um, actual network itself up here, the house model. And uh, let's have a look at our geometry. Now if we go back to our cache here, um, it's gone through all some stuff being packed up and unpacked and all sorts of things and that's where a lot of issues can occur. We've created namespaces and proper group names to try and circumnavigate some of those issues and uh, I've probably done something slightly a bit wrong maybe, I'm not entirely sure, but um, I'm not going to actually render this geometry that's coming out of the RBDIO anyway. Um, what I like to do is, um, basically if we have a look it's quite slow reading this cache off disk because um, we've basically cached up uh, a lot of geometry data and other stuff. In fact, if we click on the RBDIO node, you'll notice we've click, uh, cached out the actual pack geometry, the constraints and the proxy. So these first three inputs here. Uh, and that can be really slow. It's uh, a lot more efficient um, to do it uh, a slightly different way. And what I'm going to do actually is if we hit tab, uh, we can choose this node here, transform pieces. So what this is designed to do is um, you plug in a point cloud that's moving and uh, you plug in your geometry and uh, hopefully the attributes, the name attributes match up on the two and then it will copy the right piece to that geometry and, and to the uh, right geometry to the right point and uh, preserve all the uh, rotations for you. So what we're going to do is basically transform the unbroken geometry and um, cache out the points here to do to uh, simulate that with so we need to change the mode and write that out so here I'm going to switch this to geometry and points it's going to give him an error because I don't have that um, so I'm just going to put a suffix at the end of here let's call this uh, points so I know what it's doing and uh, I'm just going to save to disk uh, the simulation again but this time we're just going to write out the geometry which is on this left input what we're going to render and uh, the points on the right although I'm not actually going to use the left input so let me hit save to disk and uh, I'm going to pause the video while we uh, recache out that new geometry. That's now um, cached out. So um, let me just click on the uh, information here. Let me hit save to disk also on the new rest shape as well. So let's call that uh, points2. Let's actually change the hip name here to um, explode. There we go. Let's save that out as well because we need the rest geometry, that's important too. There we go, so now we've got our uh, the same kind of sim, and you'll see it's just as slow to read that... Uh, that's not too slow, read the geometry off disk. Uh, and if we look at the points, let me just plug in that last input, you'll see we get our point cloud data with all the right information on there, and that's a lot quicker to read in and out. And you'll see it's got the orient and pivot and the name attribute, and that's how it's going to map using the name attribute which piece, and obviously the uh, orient and up it's going to spin it around for us. So here's the inputs that we need. We actually need uh, the template points, which is this uh, points part here. And then we also need um, rest points. Now we can't really access the rest points from this node, but what I can do is create a file node. Just plug that into the rest points. And then on the RBDIO here, I, on the rest geometry, I can copy parameter, and then on the file node, paste relative reference. So we get our rest position. And then we want to plug in our geometry um, that we want to um, before uh, the simulation. So I'm going to come back before the uh, constraints. I don't suppose it really matters much. I'll do it here before the configure because the configure actually packs up uh, the geometry. You know, if we look here, we've got uh, 400. So if we look here, we've got nearly half a million points, and here we've got uh, 1,451. So this is packing it up. So I'm going to do it before it gets packed there. So I'm just going to feed off the uh, original geometry, so let's call that Geo. So if we look here, that's the um, the model house there. Let's turn the lighting off, there we go. So you can click on this tab here just to do your sort of default lighting rather than the scene lighting that we've changed, so we can s see it. So let me bring um, this guy down in my network. 
and then uh, I'm just going to plug it into this left hand side and if we turn this on it's basically going to transform that new geometry this point cloud using our name attribute there and uh, you'll see it's um, a lot quicker I can even drag the slider quite quickly and load in and out that cache really nicely so it's a lot faster this way and um, to do stuff and the advantage is we've got the nice geometry there with all our groups so let me feed this off to the house out node and um, that's the one that if you remember is being fed into here and that we're going to render and if we go back to frame one now we'll see look there's our groups all working so look, now we can see because um, it's the original geometry it's not gone through all the process so all our wood is wooden now and um, yeah that's all working so we still have this issue here on the glass um, I'll show you what that is let me go into the house here and again using uh, uh, the power of groups let me just add a blast node for a moment and uh, what I'm going to do is uh, select the uh, window glass but delete everything else so we can just see the glass here and you'll see it's got those edges to it so let's just have a look at what those look like if I go to the render view here I can change this from rock camera to scene view and now it's going to render the view that I just set up for that window oh look we still have the render region so to get rid of the render region hold down shift and left click and drag around the whole box so you basically drag a render region around the whole box <laughs> that's how you kind of turn it off so here we go um, hopefully we'll see our glow glass in close up there and uh, we'll see the issue that I'm trying to show so that's not great is it let's go to a more oblique angle there there we go we're not really seeing um, the issue there that's interesting so let me just twist that a bit more oh. maybe it's because we uh, deleted everything let me make sure I don't delete I think I've deleted the inner faces which is a mistake there so if we click back on material we'll see all those inner faces there so yeah in this group I've not included everything uh, if you have a look down I've also got the uh, window glass fractures here so I need to use my wild card actually and do star glass star that was the name in there there we go so now we've brought back all those um, internal faces there so that's bringing back um, all these sort of groups of the glass Look, you've also got a name attribute for that we could have used the name attribute I could have just done um, something like this at name at glass star and again that would have brought in everything there we go so we've got all our um, if I do that before the shader you'll see that I do it after the shader because that's the problem with the glass we'll see all those inner edges so yeah let me render that uh, again now this is the problem with the groups you've got to make sure you get everything see the whole story there we go and we can see these horrible inner edges which is fine, we've got that interesting refraction um, thingy going on there. Let me drag a region around that for a minute. Let's just turn the uh, ground plane off with that help. And uh, in the environment light here, let's turn on render light geometry so we see it in the background there. Is that going to help us more? Let's uh, twist it up a little bit. Yep, there we go. So we can see what's happening quite clearly there. So, um, the reason that is is because these inner edges are refracting and um, at the moment we don't have a shader on them do we so yeah in here we need to add that those groups to our shader window glass here so yeah let me again come down find where it says glass there we go let's pop a star in there we go so now those also have the shader so if we just render again that'll look a bit better but yeah the point is we don't want them there because they're causing refractions when it's static so um, there's some really nice um, tools that we can use in Houdini to do that um, there's some SOP nodes uh, essentially what they'll do is they'll measure the distance between neighboring um, objects and uh, if the distance there we go you can see that with the refractions and it looks even worse uh, so what it will do it basically measure the distance between sort of neighboring um, objects here and then um, it will give us um, some attributes that we can use to fix things with so let me show you what I mean let's dive back into our network here and uh, I'm gonna come up here to uh, just before the configure again I'm gonna lay the attributes here before everything gets packed so this time I'm gonna do RBD connected faces let's just drop that into the branch and let me plug the uh, geometry 
that I'm rendering down at the bottom into that. So I'm just replugging that nulls branch into this new node. Because what this node is going to do, it's working out on all our geometry here what's connected to what. So it's working out everything that's connected to everything else. And it's creating these attributes here. So um, if we actually... So notice I've got it coming out this uh, branch here. So if I go to the null, we can look in the spreadsheet. And if we look in the primitive attributes, it's created um, sort of primitive distance here. So we can see it's measured the distance between uh, neighboring objects for us. Um, it's just, that's all it's done is created those attributes. Now I don't want to create any constraints here. Let me turn the constraints off because uh, we've got our own constraints doing stuff. So I'm going to make sure um, turn constraints is off. Keep constraints is turned off. So um, what do we do with that? Well we've got these attributes because we're passing it straight to the geometry here. We have them here and uh, they're getting transformed obviously because we're transforming that geometry to this point. So down here, what we can do is use the its uh, complementary node. So if I hit tab, we did RBD connected faces. So this time we'll do RBD disconnected faces. There we go. So this node works in conjunction with the other one. And uh, let's just plug in our geometry. So um, this is going to do it to everything at the moment, which we don't want it to do. So I'm just going to specify up here just to work on the glass objects. So again, I'm going to click on the, um, let's just turn this on. So yeah, you need to turn it on so it evaluates. If I click on here, you'll see it'll list all the uh, groups again. So I'm going to scroll down to where it says uh, at glass again. So we'll get rid of uh, everything and just put the star in. So this will affect all the glass objects. Affect all the glass objects. So um, let's put that blast in at this point again. So I'm just going to copy this uh, group into this blast. And we could do delete non-selected. That way we'll see our windows again. There we go. Now if we had an exploded view, we can actually see what's going on here. This will just separate them based on their name attribute. And we can see that those are the inner faces that we're rendering that's causing us the problem. So this guy has measured um, this primitive distance. And this is the threshold. So any faces that are less than this threshold, in other words, they're touching, um, we could, we're creating an attribute here called disconnected. We don't really want to create an attribute. What we can do is actually say delete, delete them. So when we do that, you'll notice it's deleted all the faces that are internal there. So all the ones that were touching together. So if I just uh, go to the exploded view, we can just bring that back in. So they're slightly exploded. There we go. And you can see that all the inner edges have gone. So um, the nice thing about that is if I start to play forwards in the simulation, well, let me get framed on a window here. As I start to step forwards in the simulation, let's do this in wireframe so you can see. So you'll see there's no inner edges there. So as we step forwards and it starts to move, as soon as it moves, you'll see the inner edges magically appear. So look, there's no inner edges, inner, inner, inner edges, inner faces there, and there is inner faces here. And that's all based on that threshold. So this is really good. That will give us a nice render when things start to break. We won't see that um, horribleness, but when it moves, um, we'll get all the nice edges for the correct refraction. So let's plug out RBD disconnected faces here into this house out node. And um, let's go up one. So again, this is bringing back that new glass. So uh, let's pick a, a nice angle on there. So you'll see we're missing those inner faces this time. So now if we render, that's going to look like a nice smooth plane, like it did when I forgot to have the group there. Obviously, if I did it with the group method, then they would always be deleted. And when it fell apart, we wouldn't see them. But here, um, why can't it load? Um, ah, yep, because this is loading in a image. So why did we write that out? We didn't write that out as a um, image sequence. Let's just check this. Oh, yeah, there's an F4 there. Okay, let's just um, get rid of that error and just hit render again. Yeah, because I had dollar $F4, it was writing out um, individual frames, and we only wrote the first frame out. Since I'm on frame 4, that's not going to read it incorrectly. So now that we've written out a frame without a frame number, hopefully that's going to write in correctly. Let's stop and start the render again. And um, now we're not expecting an image sequence for our background there. So um, let's render our glass now and see it without those inner faces. So it should look like a nice smooth pane of glass. 
Um, was that in my region there? Let's make the region a bit bigger. What angle have we got on the scene? Yep, yeah, cool. Uh, maybe a bit more of a twisty angle up like that. There we go. So you'll see now we don't see those inner edges. If I go back into the house model and I just disable that disconnected node, you'll see we get them back again. So it's deleting them for us. But um, like we saw, if I just step forwards a frame, so things start to move, you'll see those inner edges appear again. And we're getting all the nice refractions through the glass and it looks like a proper piece of glass breaking up. So that's a really nice um, way of fixing uh, glass fractures, really, using those two nodes in compl in, uh, that complement each other. So back in our house object here, let's turn that back off so we see the entire house and our lovely new glass there. Let's go back to the uh, camera object here and turn on our ground. So now if we uh, just select a region around everything. Now what I like to do actually is turn this preview button off this just does that progressive render that gets less noisy and noisy and sometimes I never know when it's finished um, it does tell you here but it can take forever whereas uh, if you turn it off it just renders the tiles and when the tiles are done they're done you know that is your final quality of your render there actually let's change this to the uh, camera one rather than the scene camera and that way we can see our nice little house in the background there Excellent. So um, that's looking good. What we want to do now is um, step forward so we see a bit of our explosion in there. And uh, let's turn the actual pyro on and see what we have. Excellent. So there's a couple more um, little bits of finessing that I want to do for this render. And uh, then we'll set it off. So um, there we go, it takes a second or two, but that's starting to look quite interesting there. And we can see some nice detail coming through. And if I just um, just make a snapshot of this once it's done, you'll notice when I left click it renders under my mouse anyway. So um, we can click on the uh, snapshot here just to save a snapshot. Let me stop the render. And we'll see that that's quite comparable to the uh, 3D view there. We turn the shading back on on the 3D view. Um, we're not seeing the light in the uh, background there. It's a bit dark, but that's fine. But yeah, you'll see um, it looks similar-ish. <laughs> well, no, it looks the same. Sort of the glows and everything else do look the same. So it gives you a very good idea of the kind of uh, render that you're going to get. In fact, let's turn off the uh, render the light. We've done a render the light geometry there for the environment light. So um, there's a couple more little bits of finessing I want to do. I'm going to turn the pyro off for a second, just talk about the house. First of all, we have no motion blur. This should be flying through the air, so we should see lots of motion blur. So I'm going to go back to the out context and select my mantra node. And I'm going to turn on allow motion blur. So if I uh, render again with the IPR, you'll notice that um, actually we don't get the motion blur coming through. But that's uh, really easy to fix. So let's just wait for that to kick off. And uh, you definitely want motion blur on there because it's really going to sell the fact that these things are, are flying through the air from a distance. So um, there we go, starting at the center there. So let's have a look at these guys. So you'll see there is actually no motion blur. So the way to really get that on is these geo time samples, the geometric time samples. So if we put this to uh, number two, it's going to sample twice between the frames and work out that it's actually going to smear there. So if we have a look at these guys, you'll see they're a bit blurred. If you put higher times, higher samples in there, you'll get more precise um, twists and turns in your blur, but it will be slightly longer to render. So uh, two or three tends to be a good sweet spot for getting nice motion blur. You'll see it's slightly different. I'm going to leave it at two for that. So uh, you definitely want to turn on motion blur if you're doing stuff. But you'll notice it gets a bit noisy. Let me put a region here. So the way we uh, tune, tune the motion blur is you want to look in the alpha channel. So again, using the color correction here. And uh, again, view it at one to one pixels so you can see. And uh, the only real way to fix the noise, unfortunately, is to increase the pixel samples here, maybe five by five. And you'll see that gets uh, a lot smoother than, uh, say, two by two or three by three. So really, to get nice renders, you probably need five, six, eight, something like that to check out your smooth motion blur there. But I'm going to keep it low now just for speed of uh, rendering. For this example, let me just um, put a region around everything. 
and then uh, stop the render. So again, if we um, set up our pyro, uh, turn on our pyro, we should get motion blur with that too. So the other thing I want to talk about is uh, the illumination from our pyro itself. This, you know, is a big explosion with some flames in there, and it should be illuminating stuff in the scene. It should be generating its own light. I mean, we've got the scattering in there, so to, to suggest it's scattering light in itself, but it, you know, it should be illuminating these objects around it and generating light on the scene. Now we could get the um, render itself to cast light from that, but that's again really slow. So a nice little trick that I like to use, let me just um, get this rendered. So a nice little trick I like to use is um, Houdini's volume light. So Houdini's volume light um, will take a, an existing volume in the scene and it will use that to basically create a point cloud and create some fake um, a fake volumetric illumination from it, which looks really good. So let me just stop that render and snapshot this one as well. So we've got slightly different images, one with one without the motion blur there. So um, to do that, um, we want to click on, uh, let me go to the 3D view here. So you want to click on the uh, volume night light node at the top here. It says select a volume to light. So we'll select our pyro volume here and we'll hit enter. Remember to hit enter with your cursor over the 3D view. And we create our volume light. There we go. And this will use our volume to illuminate the scene. So um, will we see anything in the viewport? I'm not sure we, that we will. Yeah, look, we see it's kind of illuminating up. It's making the bricks a bit brighter. Now I'm going to go to the render view and actually just drag a little region here. Because uh, I'm going to hit, uh, there you go, it's going to start rendering. But you'll notice it is actually quite slow. It's slow because it's casting light onto our explosion on the pyro as well as the bricks. I don't really want the pyro to illuminate itself, you know, because uh, that's what this volume light is doing. It's scattering the light within that volume and getting it to self-illuminate. And that can make it particularly slow. So um, we are calculating the self-illumination already um, with the pyro bake volume with that emission tab, essentially. So we don't really want to double illuminate it. I mean, it does look a bit nicer and we can adjust the settings in the pyro bake to match this kind of look. So uh, let me just make that region a bit bigger, make the exposure a bit brighter so we can definitely see what's going on. So that already you can see we're getting illumination on the bricks here. They've got that sort of red color. Let's put this back to three. And you'll see overall my explosion has um, this nice sort of scattering in these regions um, because of that light. But again, that's real slow to do stuff with. But you can simulate that look if you want with quite easily with the shader. So let me just stop that for a sec. So to optimize this, what I like to use is the light linker. So I'm going to click on the little plus here, go to new paint tab type. And uh, we're going to go to mantra rendering. and We're going to choose the light linker. So the light linker lets us establish relationships between lights and objects in the scene. Um, if we do it light centric, that is. If we do it object centric, we can choose an object and choose what illuminates it. So I'm going to do it light centric. So here's my volume light. And I only want the volume light to affect the ground. And if I hold down shift, uh, sorry, control, I can choose the house. So at the moment, this guy, the volume light, is only going to cast its illumination on the ground and the house. So that should render a little quicker. Let me hit. Uh, render again. We're not going to see the illumination on the uh, volume here. Again, if I want to see that on the pyro, on the smoke, I can just play with the uh, in the pyro bake volume shader because um, it's a lot quicker to do it that way. But here I'm going to get the glow from the explosion on the bricks and on the floor and any other objects that are coming past. And again, it will cast a shadow. And we can control that illumination as you saw independently here with the exposure. So that should render a little bit quicker for us because. Um, it's not having to calculate all that light bouncing around in the volume there. So see, look, these volume tiles render a lot faster than they did before, but I've still got that nice illumination um, on my bricks. I'm getting slightly less um, because obviously there's less light being scattered generally in the volume there, but overall it renders um, a lot quicker and we should get some light spill down here on the floor, especially at the uh, beginning of the shot. So if I uh, go back to where we've got the big explosion at the beginning, we should see some ni nice light cast from this on the geometry there, which always makes it look um, a little bit better. So we've managed to um, get our shader looking reasonably nice. Um, 
we've got a nice explosion in there. I might just uh, quickly change it back to the ramp and then we can set this off for a render. So um, just as that pops through and obviously I need to increase the sampling up. So you'll see the light um, on the flames there and you'll see the light being cast across the floor here um, which is kind of what we wanted. It's really quite a nice effect. So I'm going to maybe go to frame 22 and one last little tweak. Let's just go into our pyro node here. So I've just got to wait for the, uh, first of all, the cache to load up and then the pyro bake to do its thing. So that all takes time. So again, you could cache out the pyro bake if you wanted to, to speed things up once you were happy. So here's my uh, pyro bake node. So shall I leave it on physical black body? It looks quite nice actually. So again, that's a, a personal choice on how you want that look to go. And you can see because we've uh, related our initial explosion pyro burst source to our house, you can see bits of flying off in the directions that the flames suggested, which is a, quite a nice effect. So um, yeah, I might go back to the color ramp here on the scatter and uh, I should actually just pause this and also the color ramp on the fire as well because remember they should ideally be um, tied together but again it's whichever shading model you uh, particularly like the look of um, let me just stop that render let me change this back to color ramp and uh, let's hit render and we'll see that nice color ramp one there Then we can set it up for um, the final render at this stage. And um, in the next video, um, what I'm going to do is um, we're going to look at um, actually using the full license and diving inside DOPS, which will give me access to all the uh, DOP nodes, because at the moment I don't have that. If I was to go inside DOPS, which I'm not going to go to because I'm not on frame one. It'll take a while. Um, I don't have any access to the nodes. But um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how we can start to fine tune and get a lot more custom control over our um, explosion there. And we're also going to look at how we can add some um, more interesting custom controls also inside the uh, rigid body solver. We'll transfer the force in a slightly better way. And also um, we'll add some softness, some soft springs to uh, some of the the uh, elements that explode to give a sense of ductility, a sense of them being held together before they get um, destroyed, which again will enhance the overall uh, destruction of the house there. So what we'll do is go into the pro version of Houdini um, so we can dive into DOPS and then um, we'll take it to the next level by adding more control over the way the house explodes and also um, more finer control over the look of our explosion there. So overall as a frame that's looking pretty good. So um, Again, if I just uh, compare that to the other snapshots, we can see how that's going. So um, I'm preferring the colors from the ramp for this example. So let me stop the render there. So the last thing I can do uh, to save this out to disk is to um, increase my uh, pixel samples here to a reasonable quality. So uh, maybe I'll try something like 8x8 eight eight quick, um, quickly. I might do some tests, but I'll, I'll render out the sequence and um, we can see how that looks. Uh, the other thing you can do actually to slightly speed up your renders quickly is increase the tile size here. Um, if you increase it in um, increments of uh, base 8, like 16, 32, 64 for example, you'll notice um, depending on your RAM it will speed it up uh, by a little bit but then if you go too high it will slow it down again so you want to find that sweet spot that can really uh, speed things up in your test renders there. So um, I'm going to save the scene and uh, I'll render this out. And uh, we'll see you in the next video to um, take this to the uh, next level by diving actually inside the DOP networks and adding custom uh, custom nodes inside the uh, Pyrosolver and also some custom forces and nodes inside the uh, rigid body solver. So see you in the next video.